The following is a presentation from the 10th Annual Humanities Days at Montgomery College. The power of humanities to sustain and serve. This year, we offered 32 events via Zoom and in person. To learn more about Humanities Days at Montgomery College and to access other program recordings, please go to this website. Today's session is Inclusion Through Design, the Intersectionality Between Design, Usability, and Accessibility. Uh, my name is Stacey Ford. I am the Accessible Design Center Coordinator and also the Accessible Technology Coordinator. Just a little bit about myself. I used to teach uh, desktop publishing in the digital media department, as well as I worked with uh, students with disabilities. I did some graphic design, instructional design, and I also teach. So it's kind of like collaboration of everything together. Uh, during this session, we're going to unpack if design matters, if it helps or hinders people from using or accessing content, and how much content, whether it's digital or in print, do we actually consume in a day. Um, think about how much we read, how much do we look on our phones. Raise your hand or give a shout out in the chat. Who actually uses multiple devices to get information from a day-to-day, -day, whether it's for class or just for news or anything? Who gets it from more than three places? <laughs> Take a moment to think about a moment over the past couple of years where you found something either was hard to read, hard to use, and it just was just like, I was trying to accomplish something, but I couldn't accomplish something. Does anybody want to um, give me an example of something they could think of either in the chat or just unmute and say it out loud? And I could give you an example right now. How about um, trying to fill out a form, but it never, didn't tell me what I was not filling out correctly, so I couldn't complete the form? Hi. Well, I was trying to figure out what classes I'm supposed to take with my major. I didn't know what classes I was supposed to take next semester, and I was filling out this form, and I was very confused. Oh, thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Anybody else? Hi. For me, I think it's when I first signed in for the class, I was confused on how to choose the classes, the specific classes. I think you have to go to, uh, I think I, I went to the GDES, and then um, I can't find the availability classes because I was doing it wrong. So that was the confusing part of navigating through the MC, uh, the Montgomery College website. Thank you. On the website, you said? Uh, the, the MC website, where you uh, enroll for classes. Yes. At first, that was a little bit uh, confusing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually going to bring some of these examples back in when we're going through some of the, um, the barriers in a little bit. Okay. So, so sometimes, sometimes we find things that are a little bit difficult but you can't quite put your finger on it. And to kind of just to verbalize this is like why it was difficult. I just know I had a hard time doing this, this, I couldn't complete this, but I'm not sure exactly what was the issue with it. Um, today, we're gonna look at design through two different lenses or two different perspectives on what makes design better so we can like more proactively think about our content that we make and how to design it to be more inclusive from the start, from the get-go. Most importantly, this means including and learning from other people with a, a large range of, from different perspectives. Because when we go into a situation, sometimes we view it from our lens, but we can't see it from other people's lived experiences. So that's why this design perspective is so important to be have more people into that conversation. So a little bit just about design. So design plays an integral and complex role in our societies because the, it, because the practical function and the design has implicit social functions too. So designers create products and images, but they also produce cultural meaning through those images and the products that they make. So like how we interpret some of this imagery or how do we interpret some of these interfaces might be a little bit different. So real quick before we go on and, and dive right in. So what do we think is accessibility and usability anyway? So when you hear accessibility or when you hear usability, what do you think of? It's, it should be easy to access and um, friendly to use. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? You could, you could say it out loud. You could put it in the chat, whichever your preference is. So if something's usable, what do you think it is? Or if something's accessible, what do you think that is? It's that you obtain the information you're looking for um, friend, uh, easy, easily in a website or in, in a magazine. 
Oh, absolutely. I think for me, accessibility is um, if it's available and it's easy to navigate. Is it accessible? Is it easy to navigate? Navigation is a, a fact, good factor in it too. Okay, so then we're going. So now let's unpack it a little bit even more. So honestly, a lot of good ideas on like what those meanings are. So for usability, um, they're kind of they I kind of thought in a couple different buckets. So how memorable is it? How efficient it is to go through a process? And these slides will be available to you as well. So if um, you don't want to write all these things down, uh, don't feel obligated. Um, <clears throat> about errors, um, is it forgiving? If you so, for example, that form and I forgot to fill in one of the form fields. Is it going to tell me which form field I didn't I did not fill out? Um, is it learnable? So if you're going through an interface and you've never been into that experience before, can you figure out if how to complete that process? Is the stuff that you need to accomplish that task, is it nearby? Um, and also satisfaction. What did it take almost an hour just to sign up for a, a conference, for example? <laughs> so like, how does that affect your satisfaction? Is the work and the effort that's associated with that task? How does that make you feel when you're done with that task? So now let's go into the bucket of accessibility. So accessibility um, is usually around uh, persons surrounded with persons with disabilities and like how they engage with content. So when I'm thinking about accessibility, um, is, is that same opportunity available? Is the same information available? Those interactions when it, in that environment or that task, is that the same? Are they provided with the same services? Or is a, like a video published and a deaf, a deaf user is trying to uh, complete the task, but they don't know what is being said in the video for the instructions? Um, is it also equally integrated? So is the different methods of getting the information, is it together or are they completely segregated and separate experiences? And then also, is it equivalent ease of use? Do I have to spend two more hours longer than it would from a non-disabled peer to be able to accomplish the same task? Okay, and the last one is basically inclusion. So when we're designing with inclusion in mind, what other kind of diversities are in there? There are a lot of things to kind of unpack and a lot of different factors that could take a part or have some kind of weight within that experience. So accessibility is a part, but how about access? Like do I have an access to a computer versus a mobile device? Um, tech literacy, is, it, is the process very technical where not everybody could accomplish it in this with the same ease of use. Um, economic situation, do you need a, a, a really updated computer or does four versions back still work? Um, education, we, we, live in higher, we live in higher education at the moment. So think of the jargon and the words that are used. Uh, geographic location, how about culture? Uh, the words that we use, do they still have the same cultural meaning? How about age or even language? Now, but why, why consider inclusive design in the first place? <clears throat> okay, so usually you kind of think of this into two different buckets. Um, there, I, I forget the lady's name at the moment, but she uh, is in the accessibility testing area. And she kind of came up with a story about like uh, the carrots and the stick. So the carrots are more of that social aspect of inclusion. So thinking about like social justice, equity, creating independence for users to complete tasks on their own versus a mindset of the stick, which is like compliance laws and regulations, thinking the stuff that we absolutely have to do and not really thinking about the users themselves. So just to kind of share with you is like with the why is like this why actually matters because inclusion, if you have it on the spectrum, the stick will get you to this bare minimum. That is just the baseline. But the carrots, the social justice and thinking about the users will take you much farther in that design process than just that compliance bit. Okay, 
Now, remember when we were talking about like disability and what does that look like? And now I'm going to try to stretch your idea of what disability is and let's expand it a little bit. So we have, we dividing um, disability into three different buckets. We have uh, permanent, which it's with you through your entire life. Uh, temporary, which is only for a short period of time. And then also situational. So any of us is actually in, could be in this temporary or situational bucket. So for example, um, so it's divided up to four pieces, whether based on touch, based on sight, hearing, and also speaking. So something that, if you want to take a look real quick, can anybody think of a situational, um, we're going to call it a disability, but it really isn't, a situation that um, you've had one of these barriers before? Um, as an artist, sometimes we do experience like mental block. It's not permanent, but sometimes you cannot think of any ideas, I think, based on the um, situation. No, absolutely. There, um, there was something another presentation I did was like mentioned the idea of like attention residue. Attention residue is like when you when you're coming out of a situation and you still have all those thoughts and you're bringing it into a new situation. That kind of is a barrier to try to interact in the present with that new situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds me. Actually, that reminds me of that. Supposedly, anybody else? Can you think of anything? Think about like, um, who has, okay, on your phone, who watches social media videos? Anybody? Me. Does, uh, does anybody um, keep the volume on or keep the volume off? What happens if there's no captions? Do we actually look at that video or does that make it a little bit more harder? So now thinking about like the computer, computer science and the graphic design majors and anybody who's going to run a program um, could be like even in the um, uh, business administration or health admin. So if things don't have captions to it, depending on the user, how are they going to get that information? So let's say that if it's something that is maybe it's an emergency alert, how that inclusive design is going to impact those users and how they're going to actually get that information. And do we think about that ahead of time or is that an afterthought after somebody already couldn't get to that information? So now let's let's, let's do this. Um, this little activity, there is something called the curb cut effect. And what the curb cut effect from a design perspective is we're trying to address a specific barrier for a specific type of user. So if anybody, a curb, if you're walking on, going down to Bethesda or down, down to DT, down DC, next time take a look uh, down at the road when you're crossing the street. This right here in the background, this curb cut, how it slants down and it also could have those little um, like little uh, raised dots. They're usually yellow on the street. This was designed for a person with disability. And, but here's something interesting. Curb cut effect, it was designed for someone with a disability, but all of a sudden more than that, other people benefited from it. Can anybody see in this, um, in this image, like who else kind of benefited? Why do they would benefit from it? Um, the drawing that's uh, that has a like two boxes, mm -hmm. and since it has only two wheels, it would help. It would help that person too, and maybe the bicycles and the the kids like stroll. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So now all of a sudden, the people that are using objects with wheels. They do not have to lift it and try to drag it off. What if it breaks something or jars something? Um, how about how about the person like sitting in the in the, in the bench? Yeah, he has a big big suitcase that he needs to drag, and, and a skateboarder in the far back. Mm -hmm. He needs to cross the street, so he he can use the ramp or the curb. No, absolutely. And also the the person with the cane specifically. It's like think about like what do you have to do to actually get up a steep curb, and think of the different people's needs like um about mobility. Somebody's either had arthritis or if they broke their leg or something like that, trying to like just navigate to get to place to place. 
So as we can see here, it's like there's a lot of different types of users that actually benefit from this one little design element. And um, here's just a quick little fun fact for you. <laughs> Remember the, the rumble strip or the, the raised dots I mentioned right there? Mm -hmm. Can anybody think of a reason why it would be bright yellow or it would have dots? Um, dots for blind people that they can feel the, the texture and realize there is a curb cut here. And then it's yellow for deaf people. It's yellow to get attention. Yeah, actually, you're, you're on the right trail with that. Think mm -hmm. about... Um, so, and blind, you were right. You were right on it. That's exactly why. So you have that tactile um, indicator, to, so somebody doesn't walk out on the road. But think about something who somebody might be low vision. So when you're low vision, and sometimes that color, that increased color contrast, is in, is a visual way to be able to identify what that was as well. So definitely on the right trail with that. So okay, so now what we're going to unpack a little bit more is some of these design considerations. So I put them into three different buckets, and then we're going to kind of uh, show us like how these kinds of elements could actually go into these different buckets in different ways to see what is the same and what are different. So we're going to look at this, um, things that are just associated with design, some things that are associated more with usability, and some things that are associated with the more accessibility. So the first one is about the design. Okay, now we all create something, whether it is a flyer or instructions for something. Do we create a report? Can we create a school report? Do we do a presentation? Now, one of the uh, big factors is color and contrast, because what brings our attention? We could bring something with color. If something sticks out on, let's, I'm going to just use a print flyer just because we see them when we're walking through campus or we see them when we were going to different offices and things like that. So those flyers, if there's a pop of color, does our, are our eyes brought to attention for that? But what happens if we use color in one way versus another? So if we're looking at this example, there's four different squares, uh, yellow against black, blue against white, blue and green, and then red and green. So look at if you could see look at these different examples and which ones are easier to read and which ones are more difficult to read. The top ones are easier and the lower ones are harder. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And um, this color contrast is we're looking at is like effective design. It's like if I have to read a block of paragraph text, like a block of text with this, am I going to get the information from it very easily? Or am I designed in a way so users can't use the information as well? Now, if we talk about the intersectionality between them, the usability now goes lower if we design if we choose a design with that lower contrast on the bottom. Now, from an accessibility standpoint, and this is important for like um, anybody who's doing design, web development, and um, also computer science. If you're designing content or interfaces, or let's say for the computer science, if you have to come up and design these um, touch access points, color actually matters because if it's low contrast, users will have a harder time to be able to engage with that. And then you can think of user error and how things just do not go right. So um, from an accessibility standpoint, it's actually one of the WCAG criteria. And um, if you're in design and that I would actually um, take a look and see what that means because um, it's starting to get important for those type of jobs and starting to become in those job criteria. So something to think about. So um, there's actually tools out there um, like color analyzer, color contrast checkers that are very easy to use that you could actually test to say, it's like, does it pass or does it fail? And it, the reason to use some of these things is so that we pick color combinations that will be more effective for users and increase the usability at the same time. So the next one we're gonna talk about is layout and hierarchy. Who has had to try to consume some kind of content and it was a huge block of paragraph of text? Was that easy or hard to use? And then let's say something that had heading structures and something that you could scan through. Was that easier or harder to use? So no. we're talking about layout, layout and hierarchy. 
the user ha eyes have to go to somewhere first. Mm -hmm. What are those things that their eye is going to go first? Is it because of size? Is it because of color? Or is it because, because of placement? Of size. Yeah, this one's size. And then you're going to notice that your eye kind of goes to the bigger stuff first. And then it tells you exactly what that hierarchy is. So that's important. That's what I need to know first. This is going to be secondary and this is going to be third. So like small, go ahead. Large. Mm -hmm. Like small, medium, large size of um, hierarchy. Absolutely. Does anybody have any uh, examples of like um, when you're trying to like complete a task? It's just like, and you're trying to find the information. What kind of, what kind of barriers did you come across? Some paragraphs have highlighted sentences, emphasize the major points. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Good example, Cedric. Color forms. Yep, color forms. How about um, when you're on a, on a web page, it's like trying to figure out what do you do next? It's like, where did the submit button go? Where did the next button go? Mm -hmm. Is it in the same place as it was on the last page? Was it consistent? Mm -hmm. So sometimes that consistency matters and placement matters too whenever you're thinking about that lay layout and that hierarchy. And that actually could affect um, the usability. And then think about the technology too. So if you have to scroll too far, now think about design, it's like web design and also um, different interfaces. These action items are in at the perimeter of these interfaces. Sometimes it could be harder to use. So thinking about where, how to lay out these different components and different pieces. And then if you go to print, if you're thinking about flyers, is the action item tiny, tiny, small in the bottom corner? Are people going to uh, miss that more often? Or would they engage with that more often if it was bigger and it was more prominent, either with a, with a different color or a different size? So then the third part of design is typography. And this is where I'm kind of a little bit geeky about is, um, is typography. Because typography is not always just words. It could actually be used in design as well. If you want a good example, um, uh, try Googling kinetic typography and see how ty uh, typography could actually affect communicating information in different messages. Kinetic typography is like moving text. But in this example, I'm gonna show you a couple different er issues, what's going on with typography. So in this one, it has a bunch of different types of fonts. Usually you wanna limit it to, and this is from a desktop publishing standpoint of view, is you wanted to limit to, to about like two, three tops, depending on what the situation is. The more types of fonts you use, the harder it is for to visually get acclimated to be able to read with fluency. And in this case, different fonts react in different ways. They could be close, they could be far apart, their spacing can be different, mm -hmm. and some fonts work better than others. Because an interesting phenomenon is like uh, whenever you have like a long word, depending on how much spacing it is between the letters, it could look like it's separating it into two different words. Mm -hmm. And what happens if that long word, when it's separated at that one point, it looks like it's saying two different separate words with a different meaning. So now you affect the message. So just something to think, just something to consider whenever you're using like different fonts. It's like, this one's really cool, but okay this might cause an issue a little bit later down the road. And this is actually really important for like uh, web, not so much, there's more standard fonts. You wanna use web safe fonts, but um, for graphic design, especially in print. And um, when you're doing those kind of type of things, you wanna be very cognizant of this. And um, in my class, I used to do, um, it's called the fail of the week. <laughs> if you wanna look up um, some of these design fails, uh, that's a good thing to look up on your own, just to kind of see what that looks like. There's a lot of good examples out there um, from signs, which are, think of the signs on top of a billboard type of stuff that's on top of uh, businesses, on top of their storefronts. And that's an expensive mistake to do. What if you're doing um, conference or things for booths and those things are expensive mistakes. So keeping these things considered before that happens. Now let's talk about usability next. Okay, so the first one is about keyboard access. How often do we have access to a keyboard, a trackpad, a mouse, all these different type of um, input devices? Sometimes we might have just a mobile device. So now we have different types of interfaces. But what happens if the mouse breaks? 
<laughs> what do we do? How do we, let's say that we have to fill out a uh, complete homework and we can't figure out how to get to, how to complete the assignment without the mouse. One of the accessibility criteria is actually keyboard only navigation. So here's a fun trick. For 10 minutes, try to complete a task, ditch the mouse, put it to the side, and only use a couple of different keystrokes to complete the task. Whether it is using your tab key to move forward, your shift tab key to move backwards, or your enter key to activate the button or the link. This kind of activity also kind of shows you persons with disabilities, like think about mobility, arthritis. I've had arthritis in my hands, so I actually have to use a trackpad more often than not. I can't really use a mouse anymore. Or if somebody that um, absolutely can't use a mouse because of lack of fine motor skills. So something to think about whenever we're looking at these. Now, how does this affect us? Okay, some tools, they're built not to do it. Some vendors provide services and interfaces. It just it doesn't work. So they would have to fix it. But some people do. So which kind of tools are more useful and for the wider range of people? Now let's talk about the next one, which is assistive technology. Assistive technology, who uses Siri or Alexa or something like that, either on your phone or at home? Think about, does it always work? Always work. <laughs> no. <laughs> does it know what you're saying or does it interpret it very, very wrongly? Well, sometimes uh, she or he confuses um, my question with other um, information that she, she finds. So they give me wrong information. Oh, absolutely. And I know he's trying to back. How forgiving is it to backtrack out of some of that stuff? Now, how about when we have these different types of technology, like assistive technology, we think of like Dragon Ashley speaking, which is like voice to text or text to uh, speech. Like, did you know in the Microsoft Office suite, they had, um, well, what is it called? But basically there's a functionality that reads it out loud to you. Or in Blackboard, has anybody seen the little A with the arrow going upward? <clears throat> That's Blackboard Ally. That creates different formats for, st for students to access that content. Now, with assistive technology, how to make it more usable? Does this technology inter interface or does it work with this technology? Is it robust enough to kind of play nice with each other? So when we're designing things, that's kind of one of the aspects that we want it to happen. That's a little bit of a heavier concept to unpack, but um, it's just something to think about, especially if you're in a technical field and you're actually building some of these like websites and these more complex types of projects. And also, um, if you're in uh, computer science, web design, and uh, graphic design, that WCAG criteria, they'll actually talk about this in the category for robust. And the last bit is mobility, or mobile, I'm sorry, mobile. Sometimes you want to yell at Alexa. <laughs> Completely understand. Some paragraphs, yep. Okay, so mobility. Has anybody experienced on a mobile device I'm trying to get to this website, but it's so itty bitty tiny. And then you try to zoom in and it won't, and it keeps on snapping back on you where you can't read the content. Yeah, absolutely. So now think about there's something in the background in that design aspect that is blocking that. So when it's getting blocked, um, you have to allow it to kind of be responsive or the text to reflow. Because if you ever notice, it's like sometimes you get to zoom in, but you have to keep on pushing it back and forth. And is that harder to read than all the text just kind of reflowing? So all you have to do is scroll instead. So that's mm -hmm. a different type of engagement or how we interact with it. But it does have a little bit of a uh, technical thing on the back end to kind of allow that or block it. So the design could actually be designed to block versus to reflow. And the last bit is, oh, by the way, that, that reflow bit, um, think about visual impairments. And also me, I just have glasses. I just can't see, I'm getting old. And I need it a little bit bigger. <laughs> and um, if I cannot increase the size of the information as well. Next, if you want to actually test it out, next time you're in your text messages on your phone, try just zooming in a little bit and see what it does. And you can zoom back out and um, see if the text just gets bigger, but everything stays in that area of the phone or what does it do? And now the last bit is about accessibility. 
Now, graphics and designs. Who uses these in our communications? Do we use me memes? Do we do um, put things in our in our papers or our presentations? How does that affect people using it, though? Has anybody found images and you try to put it in there and it gets really fuzzy really fast? I guess kind of small or kind of or low resolution. As, um, so what do we do when that happens? We make it smaller. Yeah. So when we make it smaller, then now how does that impact other users? Mm -hmm. So thinking about having those considerations in the forefront sometimes matters. Now with the graphics and also remember when we talked about color and the contrast is like when we're talking about these images, what kind of user, what kind of barriers can be created for users? Um, there is a decent percentage, percentage of uh, colorblind users, for example, mm -hmm. and there's different kind of colorblindness. So different colors will look differently depending on that situation. So how about we say, hey, click the red circle over here. What if it is the kind of color blindness where it turns everything to like almost grayscale? Mm -hmm. Will they know what that red is? Or how about this? How about if it says click the stop button, the red stop button, and it has stop in the middle of it. Now you have text and color. Now it expands how usable it is for, for people to engage with that interface or that task that needs to be completed. Um, for accessibility, there's actually a rule about having not color alone as the only identifier because of that kind of issue. Now, also, um, when I when I was growing up, uh, we had three kids in the house and Internet was interesting. This was back still at AOL dial up. <laughs> and um, right now we have mobile and things could still get dropped on a website. When these images don't load, let's say that image is really important. How am I still going to get that information I need? There's something called alt text, which is website, anything that's digital, you could pretty much put alt text on it, whether it's a website or whether it is a digital document or instructional materials, whatever it looks like. And that a twofold screen readers, people who are blind, what information they got to get from the um, image, that alt text is what's going to be read out loud. So close your eyes and you're trying to get that information. You're, the text is being read to you, that image, it could just say image, but maybe that has in, like something very pertinent integrally in that task that all text will give you that information. Now, the case where it doesn't load on my phone, the text will show up instead of the image. So now I still get that information. Mm -hmm. So now it's not just for disability or accessibility. It is for actually usability. Now, how about data visualization? This is a lot of information with a lot of different colors. Do you think it would be very usable to look at these different colors and try to find which one is in which slice? Yes, I think it's. Now, what would make it easier? What do you think? Because like to me, those two blues look almost identical. It's the same. It's like, what kind of assumptions are we making? Are we making it's like starting the biggest then going smallest? Mm -hmm. so thinking about like that hierarchy and also placement of the information and the last bit for accessibility oops go back last the last one was about forms now i keep on going back to the examples like is the form can it be filled out is it working if i click submit is it actually going to submit or is it if i make a mistake is it going to actually tell me where i made the mistake Let's say I click submit. It tells me I make a mistake. It clears all the information out. And then I have to fill the thing all over again. That's very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> that just happened to me last week. So I'm just like, okay, this is a good example. <laughs> um, so thinking about that design aspect. But when you're in like, a, I'm thinking about for business administration and health administration, especially if you have these key processes, that testing going through these things and going through it from a user perspective is pertinent. I've been on many government website websites where I actually have to put in um, requests to say, and it was like, okay, this is not working properly. And those kind of things could be cut off at the pass just from testing it out, making sure it works from those different types of user perspectives. Okay, now we're going to play a game. So I have a couple different examples on the screen. 
Now we talked a lot of different types of barriers. So let's, you could talk it out or you could put in the chat, what kind of barriers do you see in these situations? And like, what are some ways that you could think we could fix it to increase, to make the design even better? What do you think? The first number is, uh, it's bold, it's good, but it's the way they put it up, ups and downs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really, we cannot even, you know, sometimes people cannot read it. So it's better to put it properly. Now, if you turn your head sideways to the left and you turn your head yeah. sideways to the right, is it the same information? Yeah. No. So what no, do you do? Different. Which one comes first? I just got that. I've been looking like, what's wrong? And then now you said, told me, okay. Uh -huh. So it could be 69.89 or 68.69, right? Yep, exactly. 68.69. Is that? I honestly don't even know because I've seen them. I've seen them go up and right down in different ways. So it uh, depends on the city and that cultural mm -hmm. expectation. <laughs> and if if you also have a dyslexia, it's gonna. It's really hard to. Oh, sixty nine, eighty nine, or sixty eight, sixty nine, sixty nine, or ninety eight, ninety six. And now you're actually now you're touching point where um like some uh, like me I have a, a visual thing where like I will displace and flip things around. So I will look at that. I will kind of look at it and read it backwards sometimes <laughs> when they're in that direction. And in, in my mother language, we write from uh, right to left. So I was just reading it from top to down or down to top. So you can flip. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. I forgot about that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, which which language? Farsi. Farsi? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that one, especially when you're talking about... Um, structure and hierarchy can completely turn everything around exactly different story <laughs> can anybody think of any other some of the other issues that you see how about the welcome sign on the, number, on the third picture mm -hmm. even the second picture um the way they write don't be happy you know people can read it don't be happy worry and instead of don't worry I'd be happy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they used two different uh, fonts, but it's still not um, readable and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes that order really matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, trying to be creative sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't always work. Yes. The and third just... picture is the background. Mm -hmm. You cannot even really read because of the background. Absolutely. The, so that... the zigzag gold background mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think sometimes um view is better this mm -hmm. one is the third one is too noisy there's so many details and you don't know mm -hmm. where to look mm -hmm. exactly so it has a couple different aspects so think of the color contrast so you have gold on gold which compete yeah. and then you might be able to see the pink a little bit more because of that contrast and then in the chat on the uh, pie charts, arrows can be used to indicate the months. And we can also directly put percentages on the appropriate color. Beautiful. Absolutely. That's actually one of um, the better practices for accessibility as well. Now, those two pie charts are actually the same pie chart. Um, normal vision versus uh, tridentopia. Can there be any confusion between two different months? So if you look on the right side, you have two different color of teals that are really, really close to each other. And then remember that red against green where the colors started vibrating against each other. If you look against the teal and that uh, salmon, that pinkish kind of reddish color. And then last one is that welcome sign. It's like, if anybody doesn't know, those dots underneath, it's, bra it's supposed to imitate braille and how braille is used. It's a tactic, it's a more of a tactic, tactic, ugh. It's basically felt a language that is the dots are felt to be able to read the text and each of those combinations of six dots represent a letter if somebody is actually going to use braille is the signing going to be useful no because the, the, uh, there's no texture in those braille mm -hmm. exactly printed. and um if you want to something interesting next time you take a, a walk in yeah. campus uh, look around the campus and look at the signs you're going to notice there's actual tactile braille on some of the signs and then also um, for a design perspective, uh, like a, more of a graphic design, they do have uh, things that will actually create like business cards with the Braille 
-hmm. on top of it with the design as well. Now you just increase the usability of one piece of a material or tool. And if you want, I have a lot of the references here as well. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And my name is Stacy Ford, um, Universal Design Center coordinator, also the Accessible Technology uh, Coordinator. And if you would like to find some more information, especially um, for like the digital design aspect, we have some more blog posts on color, some of these tools I talked about, and they're on the Universal Design Center website. If you don't want to write this down, all you have to do is put Montgomery College Universal Design Center, and it is a blog site, and it should come up in the top like five hits in Google. Thank you very so much for joining us.